Um, I'm Pastor Nate. I'm from Compass Tustin. Uh, I oversee our children's ministry, uh, among other things, uh, but mainly do our children's ministry. So we're going to have um, some giveaways. We're going to do some sword drills in here, um, you know, halfway through the night because it's a long day. We're probably going to have to get up and do some stretches. And I'll tell you what, it helps the cubbies out, so it's going to help you guys out too. Um, but we are here because we love God's word. Um, again, I, I love love archaeology. It's a big passion of mine. Um, I will try to not go too long tonight. I would love to leave time at the end for questions. Um, but yeah, let's, let's get started because uh, yeah, we, we got a lot to do. So we're going to dig in to archaeology. Um, yeah, it's so fun. Uh -huh, there it is. All right. Some of you are still awake. Good to know. Okay. So, uh, First things first, I want to make sure that we are rightly thinking about archaeology. When you hear the word archaeology, there's a lot of different things that'll pop in people's minds. Some people immediately think Indiana Jones. Some people immediately think uh, digging up dinosaur bones. Some people, uh, there's just such a spectrum of things that you can think when you hear the, the word or the term archaeology. And I want to make sure that we think through it correctly because there are a lot of pitfalls that we can fall into, um, but there's a lot of great things that we can get out of this. So first of all, um, I apologize because it's going to sound a bit like a downer as we continue to go through these, but... Uh there's this thing known as archaeology's fraction. Um, archaeology's fraction, I forgot the name of the gentleman who came up with it, but he was an archaeologist himself. Uh, but he put it very well, and it's very helpful for us to think through. Uh, it, it, it's uh, in five parts, and it's, uh, or I'm sorry, four parts, and it says this. Only a small fraction of materials that remain exist due to erosion and destructive nature of human beings. So we have a very small, limited amount of things that we even can and find when we're dealing with archaeology. The next is archaeologists have surveyed only a fraction of the sites available. Uh, he even put of the sites that have been surveyed uh, only a fraction, or I'm sorry, only a fraction of the sites that have been surveyed have been excavated. Palestine alone has 5,000 sites that they have found as of 1963. They've found some more since then. Maybe surprising. Uh, but of those 150 have been excavated in part, 26 have been fully, or for the most part, fully excavated, had full excavations happen there. That is a tiny number of 5,000 sites in Palestine, this one area, only 100 and what is that? 76 places have been at least partially excavated. So there's so much information out there that we still don't have. Um, of the sites that have been archaeological, have become archaeological digs, only a fraction of those sites are actually excavated. They're actually doing digging. They're not just kind of looking around and, and doing uh, surveys. They'll do reading in, into the ground and try to find um, structures under the ground and all of that. Uh, a very small fraction happened. And only a fraction of the discovered materials have been published. Uh, for example, 25,000 cuneiform texts were discovered in Mari. Only 3,500 to 4,000 have been published. That is less than... Uh, 20% of what has been found of just these very specific texts from this very specific area has been published. Um, so that is that is archaeology's fraction is what it's known as. We have, there's so much information, so much has been lost to erosion, so much uh, that we just haven't had time to dig up. Uh, it costs a lot of money to do these digs, a lot of money to do excavation. So there's a lot of information out there. We just don't have it. But the more that we excavate, the more that we find, the more that we see uh, truly how uh, God's word is so affirmed by all of these things. And uh, uh, yeah, so we're just going to keep going through this. Uh, rightly thinking about archaeology, the next point I want to make sure that we understand is that archaeology shows data. When we think of archaeology, we can start to think of, again, um, Indiana Jones. We can start to think of a whole bunch of different things, but archaeology is really digging in, finding little pottery shards, finding uh, stone structures, a wall here, a, um, a broken thing there, an arrowhead sometimes. Uh, sometimes they'll find little fibers, literally half a centimeter wide. And centimeters are small, my friends. I know we don't use them that much, but they are tiny. Uh, and they, they analyze all of those things 
things. And all of that data is what we get and what we all agree on. Uh, we want to make sure that we understand that we're all going to agree on the data. We're all going to pick up a bone out of the dirt and say, this is a bone, and I found it right here. We can agree on that. We can test it and see, this is a bone from a cow. This was a bone from uh, you know, different testing. We'll be able to see how old it was, what specific uh, kind of cow it was. Uh, maybe we'll be able to see how it died or, or what happened to that bone. We'll be able to see those things, and those are the things that we're all going to agree on. However... We want to be aware that headlines and articles are interpretations of that data. A helpful way to think about this is you, you get the data information from the dig, and then people will come up with their own interpretation of how that happened, how that came about. Um, again, a helpful phrase that I like to do this, reading interpretation from the, going from data to interpretation is the same as going from the encyclopedia to Wikipedia. If you're familiar with Wikipedia, it's, it's really fun. You can, you can throw whatever you want on there, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Um, all of these things are, the, the data is always true. Uh, the encyclopedia are, are factual things. We know uh, you can go in there and look up, this was a factual person. This is how you pronounce this person's name. These are the things that they did. We know these things are true. Everyone will agree on that. But when you go over to Wikipedia, you can see things like, this president was great. You ask 50 different people, you're going to get 50 different answers on how they feel about that person, what they did. Um, all of those interpretations. So uh, one article that I saw last December, it was from uh, 2021, Smithsonian Magazine, um, and they said, uh, Gluck, this archeologist that they were talking about, like many archeologists then and now had a bit of the novelist in him, which might be necessary in a profession that requires you to imagine a majestic temple based on what a normal observer would swear was just a pile of rocks. And that is so true. If you really think about it, you will uh, will go through things. You'll you'll see excavation sites, and they will just see literally little tiny walls. And these people are looking at it, and they're envisioning, oh, this is what happened here. This is what was going on, just from a pile of rocks. And so. Part of that is, is necessary and very helpful, but again, you're going from the encyclopedia to Wikipedia. Everything you read on Wikipedia, not entirely true. It could be interpretation. It could just be what that person thought. It could be misinformation. Uh, all of these different ideas. So we want to make sure that we're aware of that and that we avoid that ourselves. Um, with that, archaeology does not prove or disprove anything. It doesn't prove or disprove anything. Uh, we have to be very careful how we use this. I have a um, background in aerospace engineering. That's what I got my bachelor's in. Um, now you're wondering, why are you in charge of kids in a church? It's a whole long story. I'd love to tell you about it later. But um, coming from a very science-heavy background, uh, I had a lot of conversations with people in the scientific community about these things. And if I ever tried to say that it, something is proved by this, I would get immediately shut down and rightly so, because it cannot prove things true. It can uh, corroborate things. It can uh, show that it could be true. It can affirm things, but it cannot prove things. The way that we have to look at archaeology is very similar to how you have to think in a courtroom setting. In a courtroom, you're going to hear a lot of information. You're going to hear a lot of data. And you have to decide, is this beyond a reasonable doubt? Is this can I accept this beyond a reasonable doubt? Because there will always be doubts. If you ever ask the question, um, could there be another set of circumstances that produced this data? The answer will always be yes. That's why there's so much differences with uh, scientists, why we have evolution. Could it happen? Sure, there's the you know crazy um, uh, proportions and... and um, 
uh, I'm forgetting the words, ratios of probability that these things could have come about by themselves. Sure, you know, the, the whole story of the tornado going through the junkyard, maybe it can build a 747. Uh, put a monkey in front of a typewriter, sure, I guess it could write Shakespeare. But the, the probability is just so astronomical, so ridiculous that we're, we're gonna say it's, it's not true, it can't be true. Um, but it's not going to prove or disprove anything. Because of that, um, what I wanna make sure that we understand about archeology, span and again, I love archeology, span and this sounds like such a downer, but archeology span will save exactly zero souls. Archeology span does not save anyone. Archaeology is a very helpful tool. We need to be able to defend the faith, have a reason for why we believe what we believe, but it will never save anyone. The gospel is what saves people. You can think of Luke 16, when Jesus is talking about uh, Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man is... Uh, in, in torment and asking for uh, relief. Abraham in that situation, who Lazarus is with, says no. Um, and in verse 29, the rich man, uh, or I'm sorry, Abraham says, uh, or the, sorry, Lazar, the rich man, <laughs> there it is. It's been a long week, you guys. <laughs> well done for keeping up with me. Um, uh, it gets better from here, I promise. But the rich man uh, turns to Abraham, says, hey, can you please go tell my brothers? They need to hear about this so they don't end up here. That's what we all want. We don't want people to end up in hell. Uh, Pastor Bobby was just talking about that. That is what this is all about. But Abraham says to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The rich man responds and says, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. If they see true evidence, if, they, if you could just show them how true this is. And yet what does Abraham respond with? He says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Archaeology will never save a soul. The gospel is what saves souls. Anytime you get into a conversation about archaeology, especially with people who are non-believers, we need to get to the gospel. I could talk about archaeology all day long. My poor wife, I don't know why she's here because she hears me rant about this constantly. <laughs> But it will never save anyone. We have to get to the gospel in our conversations. So that was Luke 16 right there. But what the Bible does, why this is important, archaeology does affirm the Bible's historical accuracy. And I'm pretty sure that is why you guys are here. And like I said, uh, if you weren't here before, I'm the children's ministry, or I oversee children's ministry at Col Columbus Tustin. <laughs> Columbus Tustin is the school we meet at. Um, so I do it there, technically, I guess. But... Uh, like I said, we are going to do some sword drills, so please grab your sword, because uh, I've got a couple giveaways here for whoever gets this first. Um, we're doing a sword drill, and you are going... Oh, I guess I should explain what that means for those of you who don't know who are looking at me with blank stares. Um, it's helpful to explain things when you're with a new crowd. Uh, Bible uh, sword drills is what you're going to do. You're going to get out your Bible. I'm going to say a verse. The first person to find that verse, stand up, say the first five words, you won the sword drill. And we're making sure that our swords aren't getting rusty. We're getting them out. We're knowing where to go. We're flipping through the pages. That is what a sword drill is about. Wow, if you know it by heart, you can't use your phone. <laughs> Do I still have to find it? that would be somewhat impressive, but I might have to allow it. I don't know that you're going to know this one by heart. <laughs> Um, if you do, great, go for it. But I'm going to say the verse. As soon as I say it, flip it open, type it in, whoever gets it first. Um, I got a little thing for you. It's electronic swords. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I'm just looking for the first five words. That's all I need. But you are going to Joshua 8.29. Joshua 8.29. And he hanged the king. Wow. Okay, yeah, that was fast. Wow, okay. Well, I've got a copy of Bible in Spade, which is a great uh, archaeological... Um, 
volume. Yes. Um, I've got another one for later, so keep it up. Le next time, I'll tell you what, we won't do electronic swords. Yeah. Just to make everyone happy. There you go. Okay. Wow, I didn't know that was going to be an issue. Um, we don't allow our cubbies to have that, so, you know, I, I just wasn't prepared for this problem. But um, archaeology, what I'm trying to say is archaeology affirms the Bible's historical accuracy. Joshua 8, 29, and he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. Fun story. And at sunset, Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones which stands there to this day. God made sure his people remembered specific events. He wanted people to be able to go. This author specifically wrote these words so that he could tell people, hey, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. These are historical events. Go look at the rock pile. It's still there today. Judges 6, 24 says, Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace, Jehovah Shalom. To this day it still stands at Ophrah. That is what God cares about. He wants people to trust in his word. He loves showing how truthful his word is. And so that is why I love archaeology, because I can look at it, I can clearly see uh, just how much it truly does affirm God's word. And we do not have time tonight to go over all the things that I would love to go over. Um, but before we start into all of these things, uh, here are a couple of resources. These are ones that I love to use. The Associates for Biblical Research, they're the ones that put out those magazines. Uh, they have a website. They've got a wonderful YouTube uh, page and a channel, I'm sorry. And they do a great job of doing exactly what I just talked about. They're very um, careful in how they talk about things. They don't assume. Um, we're going to talk later about discoveries that they have made, and they are um, sometimes overly cautious, where I'm like, you guys, just tell us what you found. Um, but they want to be so cautious and careful, they don't want to mislead anyone. They want everyone to be sure of what they're saying. Uh, On Script is a podcast. Uh, really helpful. I haven't listened to all of their stuff, um, but from what I've heard, they're very, very helpful, very good in getting a, um, a true sense of uh, the things that we find and how it does affirm God's scripture. So, I know that you guys are here to find out about all the fun things that we found. And there is such a, a plethora, a magnitude of things that we have found that I cannot possibly hope to cover a fraction of what they have found. So I'm fo specifically focusing tonight on things from the Old Testament and specifically not going into things of uh, Scripture. So I'm not going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls, if you don't know about it, please go look it up. Please go read about it. Such an incredible find. Um, uh, not talking about anything from the New Testament because, quite frankly, it's just embarrassing how much information we have on everything that just completely corroborates what the Bible says and its accuracy. Um, we just found another individual who uh, had a nail stuck in their um, ankle and they were buried in an actual tomb, in a family tomb, which people who try to disbelieve, disprove the Bible had said for years no one would actually get to be buried who was crucified. Um, that was a huge argument that people constantly made. And then we found someone and we were like, well, no, nope, turns out you're wrong. The Bible's right. <laughs> Crazy, I know. Uh, but that just keeps happening. And at a certain point, we got to say, I, there must be something to this book. There must be something going on. So, as I said, we're focusing on Old Testament. We're actually going to move backwards in time. I'm going to start with some of the newer stuff and then go back um, to later things. So uh, I will pop this up here. Each one of these, I'm going to have a little picture of the actual item, the name of it in the top right, the year from um, which we, we believe that it came from, the year it was made or constructed, depending on what it is, uh, what year it was found, 
Um, if it's got text, I'll try to put a little bit on there. There's so much writing, I couldn't put all of it. But then also a reference for you as well that is uh, why this is so important because of the scripture that it does agree with, the scripture that it does affirm. So this first one is the Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, the Cyrus Cylinder, King Cyrus, if you remember your Bible history, um, he is the one who brings the deported people back into the nation, uh, back to Jerusalem tells them to build the sanctuary again for years people just scoffed at this so much saying no king in his right mind in that time would ever have sent people back to their homeland would never have told them to set back up their own um, their own places of worship to, to worship the way that they used to no one would ever have done that and then we found the Cyrus cylinder and turns out the Bible was correct I know it's crazy we're gonna hear that a lot tonight but this is what some of what some of what the Cyrus cylinder says it says I Cyrus return to these sacred cities on the other side of the Tigris the sanctuaries of which have been ruins for a long time the images which used to live therein and establish for their permanent sanctuary I also gathered all their former inhabitants and returned to them their habitations. And that perfectly corroborates with what um, Ezra starts out with. Ezra 1.1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And all of that says that he is sending the people back to rebuild the sanctuary, rebuild uh, the temple, rather. And uh, this is full corroboration that this was his policy. This is what he decided to do. He wrote this cylinder saying, look, essentially it's his own propaganda. We're going to see a lot of propaganda tonight. It's fun. Uh, but he showed, look at what a great king I am. Look at what I did. And quite frankly, we love that because then we get to see this. Um, the, there's a, a lot of these that we're going to see. So, Cyrus Cylinder, and I apologize because I'm going to try to go fast because there's like a million of these. Babylonian Chronicle, or the Jerusalem Chronicle. Uh, this is from, uh, I want to make sure I get this right, yes, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, this details Nebuchadnezzar's second campaign against Judah in around 597 BC, the second deportation. Um, and it says this, in the seventh year, the month of Kislev, the king of Babylon mustered his army and marched to Hatti land, which is uh, what they called the, the essentially Babylonian name for Israel, somewhat Canaan, um, that whole area. And he encamped against the city of Judah. And on the second day of Adar, he took the city and captured it uh, and captured the king. He appointed a king of his own choice there, receiving, uh, received its heavy tribute, and sent them to Babylon. And I wish my cubbies, I keep talking about my cubbies, I miss them. We just finished our Awana year, and they're on my mind. Uh, but they would be able to tell you, because we just went over all the kings of Judah this whole year, they'd be able to tell you exactly who this is talking about. Uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he comes in, defeats Judah, and he takes captive King Jehoiachin, deports him as well as a big group of people as well as a bunch of riches from the bible says the temple um, from the king's treasury they take all that back to babylon and he puts in his place he puts in jehoiachin's place his uncle zedekiah and so zedekiah is now the king who's in charge and all of that fully corroborated right here um, by nebuchadnezzar in the babylonian chronicle he said it exactly the way that it happened and exactly the way that the Bible said it. It's crazy. The Bible is true. Uh, the Lemelech seal on jar handles. This one was found um, a little more recently, 1933. They actually found it was somewhere around a thousand. I don't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere around a thousand of these seals of jars. And uh, Lemelech is, is the wording for belonging to the king. There's a symbol on there, but the letters LMLK is what we would call them. Um, but it means belonging to the king. And it's from the seventh century. We know that in that time, it would have been the reign of Hezekiah, would have been the reign of Manasseh. If you remember anything about your Old Testament, New uh, or Jerusalem Judean kings, 
That is uh, Hezekiah, one of the great kings, one of the best kings, um, right up there with David, someone who loved God, uh, repented when he needed to, trusted God, was faithful to God, did an excellent job, and so God blessed him very much. He had great riches. He had a huge nation. Then um, his son, Manasseh, comes in. His son doesn't take after his dad, takes after his grandfather, Ahaz, and he just goes all in on all the idols, worships all the host of heaven, makes his own idol, puts it up in the temple, um, does terrible abominations, sacrifices his children to Molech, uh, does a whole bunch of things. He then goes, gets deported, fun how much God uses that, gets deported uh, to Babylon. He there, there repents in the jail cell. God restores the nation to him is what the Bible says. Such a, a beautiful picture of redemption right there. He comes back to be a great king. Uh, but in that time, there was much prospering. They had a, a great nation. And so they found all these jars that would have been used to hold uh, all of the, the food and, and the great stuff that they had. Clearly a time of prospering where they found all of this. And coincidentally, along with all these things, they found a bunch of little idols all around it which matches perfectly with what Manasseh would have been doing at the time. He would have had all of his little idols there to serve and to worship and to protect all of his property, all of those things. So again, it's crazy, I know, but God's word is true and it keeps showing to be true. Next, I've got the royal steward bula. Uh, which is a fun word. That just means a, a clay seal. I know a lot of the times you'll see um, old-fashioned, sorry, I'm going to keep trying to get out of the way for you guys, um, uh, seals like a signet ring uh, where you'd get the hot wax. We envisioned it as using hot wax on like a document. Uh, back then, they would essentially do the same thing, but with clay. So they would have their seal. They'd press it into it. Uh, it's got the words on there. And this one says, Adonai who... Um, who is over the house is what this one reads. And that is important, specifically referencing to 1 Kings and Isaiah. These are a name and a title that people who, again, want to try to disprove the Bible, they say these names in these passages are anachronistic. These names weren't in use back at that time. That title wasn't in use back at that time. The Bible was written at a different time than when it claims. Um, these events happened at different times than they claimed. But this, is, this cannot be true. And yet we found these things nine years ago now. And it clearly shows this name and this title, uh, also known as Royal Steward. If you look it up in Isaiah 22, it's going to say the Royal Steward Shebna. He, um, it says his title there, and it's the exact same Hebrew words. So we have proof that they were using these names and these titles at that time. So again, crazy, God's word is true. You may be sensing a theme here. The Taylor prism, the Sennacherib prism, again, one of my favorites. This is a huge one. Thank you so much to Sennacherib uh, for being so incredibly boastful in wanting to show all of his greatness. Uh, he makes this giant prism. It's got six sides on it and just details his giant, his, his conquest of that whole area, this Assyrian king Sennacherib. He's the one who comes through um, and just completely wipes out Israel, takes them all captive. What he tries to do then is come down for Judah, where Hezekiah is king. Uh, he actually doesn't just go straight for Jerusalem, which is in the north part of Judah. He goes all the way around, conquering all the strongholds, all the cities, and then comes back up, essentially leaving the capital for last. It would be like and I can use Canada because they would never invade us because they're too kind. Canada, if Canada decided to come and invade, it would make sense, hey, go to just Washington, D.C., go to our capital and, and try to take over there. If they instead to try to do the entire swath of the U.S. and then last come up to the capital, the essentially last bastion there, that is what Sennacherib did and took all the other cities. 
And he says on this cylinder, or on this prism that actually uses the name Hezekiah 30 times on it, more than any other king, it says, I ruined the land of Judah and imposed my yoke on Hezekiah its king. Later it says, as him, as for him, Hezekiah, I confined him inside the city Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. And if you know that passage, if you're familiar with it, that is exactly how the Bible explains this situation. They were completely surrounded. They could not go outside the walls. This is the same time when Hezekiah makes um, Hezekiah's tunnel, when they get the water, they reroute it, uh, do all those things. Hezekiah's tunnel I wanted to have in here, but we didn't have time. Another amazing find. Um, everything about how the Bible describes it is exactly the way that they found it. Uh, it's just incredible. But Sennacherib's prism, um, it, it perfectly describes all of these things. Uh, it also includes the battle uh, that he went to go fight against the Cushites, which, if you know the Bible... Uh, Sennacherib is there. He's actually at Lachish, and they, uh, he, he's taken over Lachish, which was the, the big strongholds. It would essentially be if Canada came through, they're taken over. You know, they start up in Washington. Maybe they get through Idaho. Maybe they go through um, California, and then they essentially hit Texas. And if they took Texas, I think the rest of us would just be like, okay, well, I guess you're, I guess you're in charge now. Um, but that's kind of what it was like. They, they got to that big stronghold, and that stronghold did not hold. It fell to these Assyrians. And so he, he rightfully says, I, I've confined you like a bird in a cage, uh, sends a small delegation of his army off to deal with the, the capital over there, Jerusalem. Meanwhile, he hears a rumor uh, as Isaiah prophesied and, and, and encouraged Hezekiah with, he said, hey, God's going to put a rumor in his ear. He's going to go away. Not one arrow is going to be fired into the city. Um, you do not need to worry about this guy. God will completely take care of it. And Hezekiah faithfully listened to that, trusted in God, and thanked him. Um, and so that's exactly what happened. Snacherib hears uh, about the, the Cushites, which is exactly who the Bible says he fights against. He goes up, fights against him. Um, and then they end up actually going home from there. But or uh, they, they return, God destroys a giant portion of their army, and then they go home. Um, but that is also recorded in here as well. Another part that deals with this is the Lachish reliefs. So this, again, was done by King Sennacherib. He builds his big... Um, part of his palace, this huge wall. He wants to remember how he took out the, the biggest, strongest stronghold in the land. Um, and this is what it says. It says, Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria. Look at that. Sennacherib, king of the world. Man, this guy had an ego. But thank you for your ego, because now we get to confirm what the Bible says. Um, and then he clarifies, though, king of Assyria, you know, the world, and then, but more specifically, Assyria. <laughs> Set up a throne, and the booty of Lachish passed before him. And I don't know how well you can see. Oh, you can actually see it pretty well. So this is him right here sitting on his throne. Everything is being passed by. Again, if you think about the, the logic of making this, which is propaganda, he's trying to show how, what a great king he is, why does he choose Lachish and not Jerusalem? He, he said that he had shut up the king like a bird in a cage, and yet he didn't attack. He didn't pounce on that cage. He didn't do anything to that cage. And, and we know why, because we have the rest of the story from, from God's point of view, from the uh, Judites' point of view. But he doesn't describe it because, you know, that's bad PR. He doesn't want to admit that. And just the, the, the logic that if this were um, 
if it hadn't gone down this way, he would have shown, hey, I, I, I had the, the king of Judah at my feet, which was a normal thing for Assyrian kings to do. There's another relief that another Assyrian king did. I want to say it was King Jehu of Israel that he made, where it's almost very, very similar to this. He's sitting on his throne, and King Jehu is on his face before him, and that's exactly what it says. It says that this king um, of Assyria came, conquered, and Jehu knelt at his feet. King, the king of Israel. And here, we do not see that. So even the, the, the things that aren't there, I guess, you can not build an entire case on. It does not prove that these events happened. It does not prove that it happened this way. But it fully corroborates with what the Bible says. So we can be confident in that. This was written by the Israelites' enemy, by the people who are against them. That's why I love all of these things. There's very little that we have that is actually from Israel, from Judah. All of these things are from their enemies, and that's, that's the best evidence we can have. Uh, when, when your enemy is saying the same thing that you're saying, I'm, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to say that that's a, that's, a, that's a true story there. The Tel Dan Stella. Again, this is something uh, the kingdom of David, the house of David, the dynasty of David has been under attack since the beginning of modern archaeology. Uh, they have always said that all the events of David, there, there's really three camps. There's the biblical archaeologists who will affirm what the Bible says. Um, there's another camp that says uh, these, these things did happen, but they happened much later, like 250, 300 years after. So the Bible is somewhat right, but it gets all of its dates wrong. Uh, it, it's shifted around. This isn't actually exactly how things went down. So the Bible's kind of right, but not not inerrant, not perfectly right. And then there are the people who say the, this whole thing was just essentially a myth. Uh, there is a, a very famous archaeologist who went on record and said, King David is just about as factual as King Arthur. Um, and and that, that is what he firmly believes and, and what he uh, goes by in his life. And so that is not true. <laughs> Um, surprise, surprise. But this was an amazing find, very, very helpful, because it is a very early reference to the house of David. Um, this recounts uh, a campaign of Hazael of Damascus uh, in which he defeats both Jehoram of Israel and uh, we believe it's Jehoram of Israel and most likely Ahaziah of Judah. It doesn't say their specific names, but it, just say, it does say the king of Israel. And then it specifically says the king of the house of David. These enemies of Israel, the uh, enemies of, and at this time more specifically Judah, they also firmly believed that there was a dynasty of David, that all of this goes back to him, that he is kind of the, the leader of these kings. And so it, it refutes it right there. It is not anachronistic for us to say that there was a King David. He did slay a giant. He did trust in God. He was a, um, a shepherd. He did writes poetry and, and music and songs. Um, he did all of these things. These are factual, historical events, which people will try to say is, is not true. And, and we can be firm and say, well, we, we actually have the proof. It is true. Sorry, I used the word that I said not to use. Don't say proof. Um, but it fully corroborates. It, it shows that this... This very well is what can happen. Uh, next, we've got the Moabite stone, also known as the Mesha inscription. Mesha, the Moabite king. Again, thank you so much for all of these non-Israelite kings who loved to record all of their victories. Um, and so this Moabite king, he writes down uh, his wonderful accomplishments, everything that he did. Uh, There's a lot in here. I couldn't fit it all on here, so I kind of just summarized it. Uh, but it perfectly reflects what 2 Kings 3, 4, and 5 says. It says the exact same things. It says that the Moabite king uh, calls him by name, uh, Mesha. It says that he was a sheep herder. 
Both texts say he's a sheep herder. Both of them claim that the god of Moab is Chemosh or uh, Chemosh, however you want to say that. Uh, it also has a very early reference to Yahweh as the god of Israel. That's another thing that uh, people will say is anachronistic. That, that Yahweh, he wasn't actually their god. They were... Um, polytheists, and they, they kind of just finally settled on one God much later, uh, whereas we would say, no, the, the Bible, Scripture says that they had one God who they didn't choose. He chose them, actually, is how that worked out. But this, again, is just a great showing of how, uh, no, this, this is true. We can be confident in it. It possibly also refers to the house of David. There's some discrepancy on that, so we'll, we'll take that for what it could be. Jeroboam, this one is a very, the ostracon, this one is a very new one, uh, found last year. Tiny little piece of pottery, uh, ostracon, fancy word for pottery with writing on it. Um, so there you go, you learned a new word, well done. Uh, this is uh, very, very helpful, again, because people will say that uh, the things that are written in the Bible are anachronistic. That's not how they talked back then. That's not names that they used. If you recognize this name, Jerubal, Jerubal, however you want to say it, uh, it is the name that Gideon is given after he's commissioned by God. He goes, tears down the altar of Baal, does it at night because he's, you know, a little, a little skittish. And... Uh, then the, the people find out, and so they, they change his name. And this is uh, a, a shard from a what they believe was a water pitcher um, with this name on it. It's dated to that exact time period, uh, to the, the 1100s BC. That is exactly when the time of the judges was around, when Jeroboam was around, when Gideon was around. And so again, this does not prove, we can't say that this was Gideon's water jug. Um, uh, especially a lot of people say that because it was found further north than he would be based in, but he was also a judge, um, so maybe he was roaming around. Uh, he also, unfortunately, got a little corrupt as he uh, got a little puffed up in, in what God was using him for and um, made some very foolish choices, did some bad things, um, and honestly, who hasn't left their water bottle somewhere? <laughs> so... It, it, it could be his, but we're, we're not going to say that. Um, but it does confirm that this name was used at that time. All of these claims of the Bible is anachronistic. It didn't happen at the times that it says. We keep finding things that show, oh wait, the Bible could be true. This was a name that was used at this time. This isn't made up stories. Next, the Merneptah Stele. I didn't check on what time I'm at. Okay, wow, let's go. Okay, the Merneptah Stele. Uh, really fun one. So this is written by the King Merneptah of Egypt. You can probably look at the top and think, yeah, it looks Egyptian, all right. Uh, he is in charge. He goes out and uh, decides to fight everyone up in Canaan. Um, and, and if you look at the time, it's 1211 to 128 BC when this is written. Uh, Israel, under Joshua, has at this time crossed into the Promised Lands. They've gone through the Jordan, um, and they're, they're starting their conquest, and they are well into the conquest by this time, which again, that those schools that want to go against the Bible will say that's anachronistic, it didn't happen at that time, or it was just a story that they made up. Um, yet, we see at the Merneptah Steli that, they, uh, the, that the king, uh, Merneptah of Egypt does claim that Israel is wasted, its seed is not. Specifically talking about Israel, the Israelites. And again, if you are a king and you are going and conquering people, you want to say the names that people recognize. So this was a, a nation. These people were known in that land, in that area. Um, he, it also... Um, 
uh, it's most likely, most likely the earliest and clearest extra biblical re reference to Israel as a nation. Because before, if you remember your uh, Old Testament, we're just going all over the Old Testament. Um, we had Abraham, God makes a covenant with him, uh, Abraham's son. He has a son, two sons really, but uh, the one son that actually gets the promise, the promise is going to go through. His name is changed to Israel. Then he has 12 sons. One of those sons gets sent down to Egypt, sold into slavery. Then he pulls the rest of the family over to Egypt. Time passes, that land grows, the family gets bigger, a lot bigger, uh, and then they finally leave during the exodus. And so... This would perfectly match up with what the Bible describes and how it describes that time period, that uh, timeline that the Bible gives. That timeline doesn't match up with what everyone else says. So again, anachronistic, it didn't happen. Um, but we see Merneptah sure thought that he, he had defeated these people. Turns out in his propaganda, he was a little bit wrong. The Israelites did, in fact, survive. Um, and, you know, there were, there were a couple more of them. Maybe he missed. But, again, we see that the word of God has not been proven wrong. Next, David's tabernacle. This one, again, excavated fairly recently. Now we're going to start getting to the big ones. Um, this, this is one of my favorites. It was excavated in about uh, 2010. Uh, they found it in 1911. So if that doesn't show you how long these processes take, um, I, I, I hope you can see that. It took about 100 years to get this site actually started to be excavated. Um, Fun background story with that. It was actually a, a, essentially a grave robber who came in. He was starting to dig in this area, found some stuff. Uh, he also started to dig. <laughs> no? We're good. Um, he also started to dig up under the Dome of the Rock, which is how he got in trouble, because that's a place you're not supposed to go. Um, and so he got run out of town. But they knew about this place from 1911, from that grave robber, essentially. Uh, but what this place is, David's Tabernacle, and if you see David's Tabernacle, you may scratch your head a little bit and say, wait a minute, I thought Moses made the Tabernacle. What are you talking about? Um, let's get this guy off the stage. It's too late. Why are we letting him up here? Uh, which you're partially right. But this is uh, the... Uh, flow of, of the timeline that the Bible gives. First Chronicles 13 says the ark was brought out from Kiriath Jerim. Uh, First Chronicles 15, the ark is brought to Jerusalem. If you remember, that is where David is dancing. He is uh, so excited. He's joyful, uh, essentially in shorts and a t-shirt. Uh, his wife Michael sees him. Uh, bad situation, not fun. She gets in trouble for her clear heart and what she uh, thinks is most important. And David says, I I'm going to praise God. I'm going to do whatever I can. I will be more undignified. I will be more ridiculous than this in praising my God. And for all of you who serve in Kidsmen, there you go. David did it first. He was more ridiculous. Um, if you don't serve in Kidsmen and you're looking for somewhere to serve, serve there because you get to do what David wanted to do. There you go. Plug there. Um, but he does that. Then in 1 Chronicles 16, it says that the ark was placed in a tent same word for tabernacle. Tabernacle was a tent in the city of David next to the Gihon Spring. So I apologize. I should have blown this up. I realize that now. But this is what we've got. So we've got the city of David in purple right there. Hopefully you can see that clearly. Um, that big structure, it's kind of to the top right, that is the Temple Mount. Uh, we've got this little blue guy right up here. That is the Gihon Spring. There's some blue lines that go from it. Maybe you can see that. Those are Hezekiah's tunnels, old aqueducts, things like that. But when we read this and we see that it, the tent was made uh, in the city of David next to the Gihon Spring, you're going to say in the city of David. Okay, there's the city of David right there at that time next to the Gihon Spring. So you're going to assume that it's going to go right about here is probably where we're talking about. And guess what? That's exactly the area that we're talking about. That's exactly where they found these things. 
Um, so this is an artist's rendition. This is an area, if you don't know, in especially Jerusalem, they have rebuilt and demolished so many cities there that it's kind of ridiculous. This area that we're talking about has actually been excavated, but there are buildings on top of it, so you can't really get an aerial shot of it um, because it literally has a ceiling that's much shorter than this. Uh, so that's why this is just a, an artist's rendition of um, a essentially what an aerial shot would look like. But this is what we have. I'm gonna be going from right to left because that how, is how the building is laid out in explaining it. Um, and there is there are people who will say, no, this wasn't uh, a, a tabernacle. This, this isn't what the Bible's talking about because the Bible's not true. Um, and yet there's some really compelling evidence here. So that very first room, just an answer room, very usual. They, they all know what that's about. There's really no question on that. Um, um, it was a, a, an area where the priests could change, could get into their holy garments. Um, you know, they've got their whole deal that they need to get into. So that's a, an easy area where they can do that to prepare to walk into the rest of the area. Room two. So this little, this little thing right here is where we're going to be looking next. That hole in the wall and then that groove in the ground. Room two is very clearly an olive press. There's almost no debate on that. It's very clear. And it is a tiny olive press. They're not mass producing anything here. This is a very, very small area. Uh, they are making these uh, this uh, olive oil. I almost called it olive juice. It's been a long weekend, you guys. Well done for staying with me. Um, uh, they are making olive oil here, uh, and that corroborates very well with uh, 1 Kings 1. 1 Kings 1, verses 38 and 39 says, So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, a whole bunch of people, went down, and if you remember... Pull this up. Here's the city of David. It's up the hill. The Gihon Spring is down a hill right there. You can't see it too well. Over here you can see better. This is a hill. This is the Kidron Valley. Gihon Spring is down in that valley. So they go down from the city of David. Where was I? There we go. Down and had Solomon ride on da King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. There, Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, long live King Solomon. This is King Solomon becoming the king. Um, but it makes sense to have a very small olive press when you're making olive oil in very small quantities for holy reasons, for anointing kings, for anointing. We're going to see a little bit later. Um, they would have standing stones that we would need to anoint for uh, using f in, in sacrifices, for doing a whole bunch of other things. But they would make it in very small quantities because this was holy. They wanted it to be special. Room three, uh, this is a very intriguing room, is the Bema room. Uh, if you know that term, just means a raised platform, really. Um, and this is that raised platform that's talking about right in the back corner over there. Uh, there's this open space right here, again, probably for storage. They can put stuff in there. Um, but that seat, that raised platform, is coincidentally... Uh, slightly larger than the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. So some people think, and I think they've got a good case, and again, we can't prove anything with archaeology, but many people think that that is where the Ark sat, where it was. Uh, it makes sense because there's also this groove right here, a nice drain. If you're sprinkling blood, doing sacrifices, all of that, you're going to want a drain where that all can go. You're not going to want that to pool in one area. So that's where that is. Next in this area, we've got a standing stone. Standing stones, uh, very important in the Old Testament. We haven't done anything in a while, so we're going to do another... Um, Sword drill, so grab your non-electronic swords if you have them. And this one is going to be for the actually more recent Bible in Spade, which is put out by um, Associates for Biblical Research. So first one to get to it, say the first 
I'm going to say three words. We'll see it from there. First three words, uh, and this is yours. You are going to Genesis 35, 14. Genesis 35, 14. Hey, Jacob. Ooh, quick. Well done. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. That was good. Awesome. Genesis 35, 14. If you're not familiar, this is when Jacob uh, lies down, has the dream of the angels ascending and descending. So he wakes up in the morning and the Bible says, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. This was a fairly regular practice that they had back then. They would set up a standing stone, a remembrance they may inscribe something on it. They would definitely anoint it with oil. Um, they would have some sort of sacrifice when it uh, went up. But again, just a, a remembrance of what has happened. And that would make sense if this was in a, a, a tabernacle, which uh, I'm sorry, I didn't um, say that. So there's the structure of this, and then the tent would have just gone over it, is how um, they, they say that this would have worked. So you still actually have a tent. It's not a full building. Um, essentially walls with no roof. Room five, um, possible sacrificial room. This one is a bit enigmatic. There's these big, deep V grooves. There's another groove uh, where that gentleman is standing over there. Um, that uh, I believe it's like two dots, two circular grooves. Um, it's a little bit strange, but the leading idea on it, and uh, I actually, I don't know that I clarified this, but this is still ongoing. They're still searching this and, and trying to figure it out. Um, but they uh, believe that this is where sacrifices would have happened. They would have had a table there, and the legs of the table would be held in place by these grooves. Um, I can tell you, and, and from hearing their explanation of it, I can concur. Uh, I used to be a meat cutter. I used to be in the back room in the grocery stores cutting up all the animals. And I can tell you, you want a sturdy table. You don't want that table to move. It's not fun. So um, take it from me. That would make a lot of sense why they would want that there, especially on sandstone. If, if it was just on flat surface, that table would move all around. It would be terrible. Um, they also believe that because there's a hole in the wall that's not in this picture right here. Um, but it would have had a, uh, a rope that was tying the animal down. Um, so again, they, they're, they're kind of putting all of these pieces together, essentially envisioning a palace when they see a pile of rocks. Um, but it, it can be helpful here, and it, it does seem to make logical sense with what they're um, proposing here. Uh, so sacrificial room where they would cut it up, they would do all of that. The very last room, there's not much to see. It's a very small room. Uh, seems like it would just be a storage area. Uh, they would you know, probably keep the knives in there, um, uh, just keep uh, any equipment that they need, anything like that. Um, some have suggested that it may have actually been uh, where the Ark was kept in there, and it would, it would have been treated rather like a holy of holies, um, the farthest into the tabernacle, um, but again, that is that's a, just, just a speculation, um, and so that's that's that. That's David's tabernacle. Um, next, I've got a, a few people that I want to look at. Adam Zertal, uh, he was an archaeologist, um, grew up, uh, I believe, actually communist, um, did not believe the Bible, uh, grew up very opposed to the Bible, um, and yet through archaeology, when he truly started to study it, he came to understand and, and see the, um, the, the corroboration that historical uh, evidence of what the Bible says. And so this is a quote that I grabbed from him. Uh, and he, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what he discovered in a minute. But this is what it says. He says, we discovered this place all covered with stones in April 1980. At that time, I never dreamt that we were dealing with the altar. Because I, had, I was taught in Tel Aviv University, the center of anti-biblical tendencies, where I learned that biblical theories are untrue and that biblical accounts were written later and the like, 
I didn't even know of the story of Joshua's altar, but we surveyed every meter of the site, and in the course of nine years of excavation, we discovered a very old structure with no parallels to anything we had seen before. This guy started out with uh, no knowledge of biblical things, uh, went to a place that rejected the Bible as truth, and yet he came out looking at the data, looking at uh, the findings everywhere and saying, there, there's too much here. There's too much evidence. This is beyond a reasonable doubt. I can say that. I can have confidence in what God's word says. The specific thing he's talking about right here is Joshua's curse altar. Uh, it's on Mount Ebal. It was uh, excavated in 1980 to 1986. Uh, as he said there, it was a six-year excavation, um, or I'm sorry, nine-year excavation, uh, which again tells you how long these things take. Uh, but this is, uh, the reference here is from Deuteronomy 27, verses 8 through 4. And what that's uh, describing is when the people came, uh, God commanded the people through Moses, when you come into the land, uh, you're going to have the blessings and the curses read. You're going to have six tribes get up on the Mount of Blessing. You're going to have six tribes to go up on the Mount of Curses. Uh, and you are going to proclaim those things and remind yourselves of what I have said. E even looking at these things, we have to remember what he has said. Uh, and so Deuteronomy 27, 4 through 8 says this, And when you cross over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. And there and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly." I love that. There's a perspicuity to Scripture. There is a, a clarity to Scripture. God is so clear in getting his point and message across. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm a pastor. We read a verse and we want to talk about the verse, but that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, we are talking about this altar that is made. And so this is the site. It's a foot-shaped enclosure. Um, fun story on that. There are so many of these shaped areas that they... Uh, they, they are known as foot-shaped enclosures. Um, they don't know that that's what shape they were trying to make, but it seems very like a, very much like a foot. Um, and they think that maybe they made that specifically because, what, because of what God said, everywhere your foot touches that land, I'm going to give you. Um, and so they were specifically remembering that. Again, that is speculation, um, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, so when Adam Zertal first found this area, uh, area A up here is the actual altar area. There's a ramp up here up to the altar. Um, God said in specific instructions, you are always to come upstairs to an altar. Um, you are never to put an altar lower than yourself. You always need to come up to it. Um, some little areas of preparation to the side. Another little building over here. Um, all of the items from area A, they put in the east dump. All of the the material and everything that they dug out from other areas got put mainly in the center dump. Uh, area B, mainly in the west dump, but they also got some other stuff in there as well. Um, so they, they were very careful in how they excavated this so that they knew all of this stuff came from here, all of this stuff came from here. Very, very organized. We're very thankful for that because of what was found much later. So this happened in the 1980s. Um, Earlier this year, they found this going through that east dump up at the top, which was taken from the actual um, altar site. So as they are sifting through, they used a, a technique called wet sifting. This was done by the Associates for Biblical Research, those people that I was talking about, uh, same people that put out that magazine. But this is what they found, and it's called Joshua's Curse, or, uh, the, the Curse Tablets. It's a folded lead tablet. It's folded twice. So imagine your piece of paper, you fold it once and then you fold it down and that's what you got, your little square. It's about two centimeters by two centimeters. Um, so when it's unfolded, it's about four centimeters by four centimeters long. 
but this is um, the, the folded tablet that they found as they were wet sifting through all these things. Tiny, tiny little thing. Finding a, an item two centimeters by two centimeters in rubble, in dirt, in dust, uh, but they found it because of this, this great new um, technique that they are using to sift through all the, the little little things that helps that stuff like this pop out much better. Uh, so hopefully we'll find more things like this. Uh, but this is what they found. Uh, and this is what it says. This isn't all of what it says, but this is what they've released so far. Everyone has confirmed this is what it says. Um, there's no doubt to it. Some of the other things, there's a little bit of question. Again, they want to be very careful in how they present it. So they're actually going to like third parties, second parties, uh, they're going to all the parties, trying to make sure that what they are putting forth is true, um, that there's no debate in this, but this is what they have released that everyone is sure of. This is what it says. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by the God Yahweh. You will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed by Yahweh. Cursed, cursed, cursed. And so this is uh, a curse. <laughs> I know it's surprising. Uh, but this is what was written. It, again, matches so well with Mount Ebal being the Mount of Curses. This is where uh, Joshua set up the altar where God told him to set it up. Um, it just matches so perfectly with what God's Word says. Uh, this is the uh, divine name Yahweh from Mount Ebal in proto-alphabetic script. Uh, this, if you're familiar with, um, oh dear, what's it called? The Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, hieroglyphics, they're pictures, they're not letters. And so that's what this would be, proto-alphabetic before the alphabet. Um, so these are pictures that represent letters. And so we've got the, the YHW right there. Um, um, representing God's name. And so that's what we see on this cursed tablet. Uh, an amazing find. They literally just found it earlier this year within the past uh, two months. Um, and again, it just perfectly corroborates what God's word says. We can have great confidence in it. This is Eilat Mazur. Uh, she is also, she was an archaeologist. She actually just passed away last year. I believe she was 57. Um, she unfortunately died of a uh, sickness that got prolonged. I know it wasn't COVID, but I don't know what it was. Um, but she is another great example of archaeology, uh, people having to wrestle with the truth that they see in archaeology, wrestle with the data, uh, and coming out the other side being firm in what the Bible says. So the top is an early quote of what she said. Uh, she said, what is amazing about the Bible is that very often, very often, we see that it is very accurate and sometimes amazingly accurate. She, as a, uh, a non-Christian, non-believer, uh, didn't, didn't believe in any of that stuff, she looked at it and she said, there, there's something here. This book is too accurate sometimes. And later on in life, once she, she grew to understand it, I, I don't know that she was a Christian, um, but I do believe, I do know that she had a confidence in the historicity of the Bible, the accuracy of it. And she said, I work with the Bible in one hand and the tools of excavation in another. And that's literally what she did. She is now known as the Queen of Jerusalem archaeology because she took God's word and said, okay, what does it say? Let's go look for it. That is what she did. Um, such a, an amazing thing. And so uh, what she uh, discovered was this, what is known as King David's Palace. This is still being excavated again. She, she just passed away last year, so she didn't get to finish out this excavation. Um, but the, the story goes that she was reading the Bible one day, which is a good sign, good job. And in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verse 11, it talks about King Hiram of Tyre sent envoys to David with cedar logs, carpenters, and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. Skipping down to verse 17, it says, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up in search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. 
Now we knew where David's stronghold was. That has been found long ago. Everyone, not everyone, most people are convinced it is David's strongholds. Uh, there's, there's not much question about it. So she literally looked at this verse and said, okay, if this is true, then we had the stronghold of David, which is at the bottom of the hill, and he went down to it. So if we go up the hill, then we're going to find his palace. And that is exactly what she did. And she started digging, and this is what they've started to excavate. It is still uh, being excavated. There's still a lot of question. People are throwing um, different ideas about what it is. Um, but the things that people can agree on is this was, it could very well be palatial. It was big. It was grand. Um, it was something very, very special and, and, a, and a big deal. And it dates to the right time of David. So again, everything just coming together to show uh, that God's word is true. And again, I, I don't know that that story is true. I, I've heard it from multiple sources, so I, I assume it's true. But I love that idea that she looked at God's word, saw what it said, and said, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to search it. If God's word says it's here, I'm going to go look there and see where it is. Who's familiar with whiplash? Whiplash, anyone? Yeah? If you're in a car, usually, and you get hit, something like that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, not, it's not a fun technical term. I'm not being trying to trick you here. Uh, whiplash. Yeah, okay. Well, you're all about to get it because time's ticking, and i got to go quick. So uh, what I hope that you remember from all of this, if you can only pick one thing, remember this. Be like Elot Mazer, not in looking for archaeology, but in looking for the truth of what God's word says. When God's word says something, go act on it. Go do what he says. Now you're understanding what I meant by whiplash. We're going a totally different direction here now. We need to look at God's word, know that it is true. If at all you are confident that God's word is true, then you need to do something about it. It should change your life. Anytime you see things like this, anytime you see, wow, God's word is true. I can be more confident in it. I can have more faith in this. Then it should cause you to be conformed to the image of his son. It should cause you to do what he says. When he says in, in Galatians 6, if you sow to the spirit, you will reap to the spirit eternal life. Then that is what's going to happen if you sow to the spirit. But the contrast is the same. If you reap to the flesh, you will reap from the flesh corruption. So what are you going to reap to? Are you waking up in the morning? I, I, I know this is true. I'm confident in it. So I'm going to act on it. Are you confident in God's word enough to be slow to anger, to bear with one another, to practice the one another's with people in your church? Are you confident enough in God's word to cast your cares on him because he loves you? We just heard from Pastor Bobby talking about the immense love that Jesus has for us in that he chose of his authority of which he has absolute authority. He chose to come and die a terrible death for us. He cares for us. So are we going to live that way? Are we going to look at it and change our life? Are we going to count more others as more important than ourselves? That is what I hope that you take away from this. Again, I, I, I love archaeology. I love to talk about it. But the love, thing I love more is Jesus. The thing I love more is the Bible. Because that is where we see truth. That is where lives can be changed. That is where we can go from walking in the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That is where we can share hope, true hope, with others. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray really quick. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. Ooh, I've got four minutes. Let's pray really quick. Um, and, and we can, we can close out. Uh, I can give you an option here, but uh, let's pray and close. 
Uh, dear God, we are so incredibly thankful for what you have given us in your word. Uh, God, it has con been confirmed in, in so many ways. And God, you continue to confirm it through archaeology. And I'm so thankful for the men and women who uh, have devoted their lives to digging out in the dirt with no promise of finding anything, but who are faithful in searching out what has been left so that they can show and, and, and help people see that your word is true, that your word is accurate. God, I pray that from this uh, Weekend uh, culminating tomorrow morning, God, I pray that we would see the supremacy of your word, that we would leave more confident in it, that we would see the inerrancy, that we would see the authority in it, and that, God, we would leave here changed. We would go back to our respective homes, back to our respective churches, and, God, that we would uh, be an igniting fire within our churches to look to your word, to cling to your word, to love your word, and to obey your word for your honor and glory because you are deserving of it. God, I thank you for this time together. Please, as, uh, as we travel back home tonight, tomorrow, uh, whenever, God, please give us safety in that. Uh, but again, I, I just pray that we would be people who stand up for your word. It's in the name of our churches because we love your word. In it is truth, are the words of life. God, let us act on those words. So we thank you so much. Pray this in your name. Amen.